Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on your Friday, probably your Friday afternoon, maybe morning. Um, today, we are gonna take a deep dive looking at the Inscribe platform and the ways that we are helping institutions really reimagine their approach to supporting students. So my name is Katie Kapler. I am one of the co-founders and I'm CEO at Inscribe and I'll be your guide on this journey today. A um, little background on me, I've been working in higher ed and ed tech really my whole career. Started out at a company called eCollege, which might be familiar to some of you. Um, for those that are not aware, eCollege was one of the early learning management platforms in the market. And really the one sort of late 90s, early 2000s that supported a lot of the emerging fully online programs. Um, so in my career, I got to be at the forefront of that online learning movement. And I also got to work with a population of students, which you know, we would now consider the non-traditional student population. And that working with those students was a big inspiration for my team and I in creating Inscribe. Um, we think that in, in large part, really the future of what will happen in post-secondary education is gonna be driven by this population of learners. And when we think about that, it's a broad group of people. Um, they're parenting, they're working, they're returning to school. So maybe they're a little bit older. Uh, some of them are first in their family to attend college. A lot of them are learning online. And I think what's interesting is that for this population, for schools that would normally have considered themselves only focused on more of a traditional student population, we are hearing from them that, that even they are seeing a broadening of the types of students that they serve and seeing that some of their, what they, who they thought were traditional students actually fall into some of these non-traditional categories. And so figuring out how to better serve this student population and help them succeed is something that every institution I think is thinking about. And the reason that we have to maybe think about approaching this population of learners a little differently is, you know, they don't have a lot of time or flexibility necessarily in their day. They're very busy and they also maybe don't have as much uh, experience navigating some of the complexities of the post-secondary landscape. And so creating support systems for them that are holistic, that are really flexible on demand and can meet those students where they are is what will really transform their lives and help them be successful. Because the reality is supporting any type of students is really hard. Um, and the traditional systems that we have in place today to provide that support kind of exacerbate the challenges that we face. A lot of systems today still rely on things like individual emails or phone calls. And there's so many of those that can come in. Oftentimes as a support person, we find we're answering the same question in those communications over and over and over again. Um, so the scalability and the time of your staff and your faculty is stressed by that. Um, and then when there are opportunities to maybe meet in person or collaborate directly, a lot of times it's not really the people that need help that show up. And, and in some cases that's because you know, students that need a lot of help maybe are a bit more shy or, um, or with the non-traditional student population that the time that's available for them to come meet with you just doesn't work with their schedule. You know, they're learning at 9 p.m. at night and you're available to help them between 8 p.m. and you know, 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. So those things don't align very well. And then of course you have these, you have a set of students who don't speak up at all. And, and partly that's driven by shyness, but sometimes, you know, students don't even realize where to go for help. They know they're stuck. They feel like they have a challenge, but figuring out the right channel or the right opportunity for that um, can be really difficult. And so we want to help students um, figure out how to more easily connect with the support resources and teams that they need and do it in a way that helps institutions scale those folks and help them, you know, put their time toward the activities that are most effective. And here's how we do that. So we Inscribe is a learning community platform. We cut across the traditional silos of support that sometimes exist in an institution. So whether the student has a question about registration or financial aid, or they're thinking about their academics, or they're starting to prepare for you know, leaving the school and entering their career, Inscribe can create a single experience that those students can turn to really no matter what type of help they need. 
And then within our platform, we are connecting those students with their peers and with the right folks within your organization. So sometimes those are advisors, coaches, faculty, TAs, tutors. Um, we make sure that we gather those folks into the community with the students. So everybody is there to help each other and provide answers. The other really important part is that when a question is asked and answered, it's tagged and stored in the Inscribe repository. So the next student that comes along has the same question rather than reposing it, they can actually see that um, answer and get what they need right away. So we're helping that student connect to a solution more quickly. And we're helping the support team, again, not having to repeat their answers multiple times. But community isn't just about getting answers. It's also about connecting with people. And so within Inscribe, we create spaces for students to find folks like them, similar background, shared experiences, same aspirations. And especially for students who don't have the opportunity to spend a lot of time on campus, being able to establish that sense of connection and belonging um, and be able to do it in a virtual and on-demand way is just crit so critical to their motivation and confidence and for a lot of them for their ability to stay on track. Hey, Katie, um, so, there's a question in there. Yes, in please. Um, and this, what you just showed here kind of leads well into that. Um, but will Inscribe be implemented at the enterprise level or do you work with subgroups within an institution? Great question. So um, both cases are, um, we've, we work in both examples. So in some cases, Inscribe may be implemented across that entire student life cycle. Other times we'll work just on a particular area that a school is really focused on. So whether that's like onboarding or student success or helping to scale support for their academics, um, you can follow both models. Oftentimes we might start in one area where there's a particular pain point. And then, you know, as we start to work with that institution, we'll find other opportunities to build community. And it's not uncommon for an institution to have multiple different communities that are serving different purposes uh, that students can belong to. And we'll see in a second how that works and how you can navigate easily between them. Wonderful. So I just want to remind everyone um, and welcome anyone who's joined at this point. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We want to make this as conversational as possible. Yes, welcome everybody. Um, so with Inscribe, we're focused on centralizing communication so that everything can happen in a single space. Again, automatically storing and sharing answers so that um, students connect to solutions more quickly. Uh, and also we really are about providing insights into your student population. So we provide very granular data about the activity of each student or of the community overall. Uh, but also, of course, you can see the details of what students are actually asking and thinking about. And it's amazing what you learn, you know, when you let students just voice where they're, what they're excited about, what they're worried about, what they're confused about, you can learn a tremendous amount. And that information is really useful about informing, you know, other areas of communication across the school. Um, and, you know, because of the nature of Inscribe, that it's always available, uh, and that a student really is participating in this community on their own terms. What we tend to see is a lot of students who either wouldn't have shown up for an in-person activity or certainly wouldn't have you know, raised their hand to speak up in that environment. They find the courage and the opportunity to do that when they're in this virtual community space. So you'll start to hear from a lot of folks that you might not have heard from before. Um, so with that, I think we're gonna jump over and start looking at the platform itself. Um, and then we can come back to these slides in a second for, um, for our conclusion. So I mentioned that Inscribe gets used in, a, in several different sort of use cases. I'm gonna start with this use case around student success. Um, and we'll kind of walk through the platform here and then I'll jump over to an academic example and we can see how the community kind of transforms itself to serve a slightly different purpose. I'm also going to demo inscribe like sort of standalone right now, but one of the most important things about our platform is that it is designed for integration and we are all about meeting your students, your staff and your faculty where they already are. So sometimes that's the learning management system, sometimes that's a website or a portal or another application. 
just know that we um, will provide those integrations and those touch points in all of those places. So there's not another destination somebody has to go to. Inscript's always right there when they need it. Just to orient ourselves here, we are in the uh, Inscribe organization. So of course this would be branded for your institution. And we are in this today in the student success community. As I mentioned, it's very common for an institution to have multiple communities. So in this case, we're orienting more around onboarding or connecting with advisor or coaches. And then within the community, the main way that content is organized is by topic area. So as an example here, get a strong start, meet your classmates, tips for managing coursework. You can start to see this mix of the practical items of I need help and I need to get unstuck and the more social component of meeting people and finding and identifying folks like me. Uh, topics are totally customizable. So once we know what your use case is, we'll provide a template that you can start with, but of course you can add, remove, rename topics so that it really aligns with um, the language that you use at your institution. Uh, we also have a concept of channels in our communities and those are subgroups that uh, students can essentially opt into if they uh, if it's a group of folks that they think are going to have conversations that they would be interested in. So in this example, we have our channels around kind of affinity groups that a student might want to, to join or belong to within their school. Um, these are pretty common examples that we see in a student success community, but again, totally customizable. Um, also know that channels can be um, public like this, so I can browse what's available and join the things that are interesting to me, or they can be made private. So a, a student has to be invited or added specifically to the channel for them to be able to see it. But really the heart of the platform is the conversations area. So um, if we jump into one of these topics, um, we can see that there's two sort of types of content in our platform. There's the conversations, which you see here, and then we also have a resources area. So we'll touch on each of these individually. Now, when a student comes to us, I would say there's kind of two reasons a student's gonna come into your community. One is they're stuck and they have a question and they need help. Um, the other is maybe they're just coming in to sort of browse and look around and see what's available. So students that are coming to browse are probably gonna start on the homepage, they might you know, go to your topics page and explore and kind of dig in from there. But if you have a student who's coming with a particular question, the first thing they're gonna do is search to see if they can find the answer to their question. Um, so uh, everything in the Inscribe platform is searchable. Um, all content is searchable and really reinforcing that opportunity to reuse things. And so our goal is that, you know, maybe somebody's already asked or started a conversation around what the student is interested in. They can jump right to it and get the answer they need from there. Now, in this case, the answer hasn't been provided. So the other thing a student could do is upvote, essentially, or thumbs up somebody else's question to reinforce that that's something that they're also thinking about. And now as a moderator or as another participant in the community, you can see that this is a hot topic and might want to jump in and provide a resolution here. Now, not all students will search, or maybe you think that you know what your question is so unique, uh, there's not going to be an answer. So you might go to start a new conversation. Well, one of the nice things about Inscribe is even if I um, uh, skip over the search process and go directly to posting a new question, the system is actually going to present some results to me anyway. So this is Rosie. Rosie is the technology assistant that lives within the Inscribe communities and just helps facilitate some of the interactions between the, the individuals. So in this case, Rosie's identified that there are some existing solutions that might help this student and is going to suggest them. And a student could just preview that content here, see if it's useful or not, um, and then maybe get what they need and move on. Of course, not every question is going to be answered. So we'll add a new question to the community. And you can choose which channel you posted in, and you can attach it to a particular topic. And we'll add some details. Now, a couple of things about posting. You can see here that there's a little WYSIWYG. So students can easily add images, videos, 
um, links to other websites. So there's lots of ways to add content when they're posting a new question. We also give students a lot of control over their visibility in the community. So one of the ways that we do that is that when a student posts a question, they have three options on how that post is gonna be made. Uh, they could choose to just post it to everybody. So all the members of the community will see it and be able to interact with it. They might choose to post anonymously, which means that everyone can see the post, but my identity as the poster is hidden from the other members of the community. Important to note that uh, that identity is not hidden to the moderators. The moderators can always see who that individual is. So, you know, we reinforce good behavior, but it's a way for, again, sort of shy or people who are a little nervous about joining in, giving them that on ramp. Um, and then finally, I could post just to the moderators. So it's kind of a private question, or I don't want everyone to see it. Now I'm having a private dialogue between myself and the moderators of the community. So I'm going to pause there and just see, Danielle, if any questions have come in along the way or anything you want me to touch on before I, I do have a question and it's really in regards to the overarching setup of communities oh, yeah, um, please. how many communities can an institution create each year and what are the most popular types of communities that you see so there's no limit to the number of communities you could create I think one of our partners maybe this spring set up 45 or 50 new communities in a go. So, um, you know, it, it's really depending on the types of communities you're setting up, how many you are likely to have. But um, the probably the most common use cases that we see are a, along each phase of that life cycle. So we have a, a number of communities that actually focus on enrollment and admissions. So they're geared towards pre-admit students. Um, then we have a number of communities that focus in this area, which I would call sort of onboarding and student success. Again, where we're really about connecting with coaches and advisors and keeping students motivated and understanding the logistics of things. Um, and then we have a big number of communities that focus on academics. And we'll look at an example of that in a minute. But those tend to be, you know, the faculty are using that as a place to centralize the questions that are happening around a course or a um, set of courses. And oftentimes those types of communities include TAs or even tutors from the tutoring center as part of the folks providing the answers and solutions. Perfect. And then the next two questions, um, I think you might get to later on in the demo, but let's just make sure that we address them now. Um, the first is in regard to privacy. So how are we protecting student privacy? And then the second is misinformation. How are you working with or, or handling misinformation? Right. So we, so we'll take the first one first. So we address privacy in a number of different ways. Um, first of all, you control, so starting at the very top, you control who accesses your community. And so, um, you know, people outside your organization um, are not allowed in unless you let them. And even within the institution, you can isolate down the participants to a particular group of students if that's what you want. And each community can have a different set of participants. That's totally up to you. Um, and then of course the students know as they go into the community who the participants are and the, like what the purpose of the community is. And, and by informing the student, we then give the student agency over how they appear in the community. Um, one of the ways that that happens is through the display name that shows when a student makes a post uh, and the image that appears here. So I'll just jump to this really quickly so we can take a look at it. Um, so within the profile area, a student has the ability to edit the picture that appears and the name that displays to the other members of the community. They can also add like a little bio and some other links here if they want to. So that way the other members are only seeing the information that that student wants to share. Now, again, as a moderator, you can see who those individuals are, but um, the other members of the community might not be able to see that. And then the last is really what we had talked about before where as a student, I can control when I'm posting something, what my level of visibility is. So. It's really about who's in the community, informing the students about that, and then giving them the control over who can see what about them. The, I now I've already forgotten what the other, oh yes, misinformation. So um, it doesn't happen, I will say it doesn't happen very often that uh, an incorrect answer or post gets added to the community. 
Um, if it were to happen, there's a lot of tools for moderators. Um, let me go back and find something with an answer. Here we go. So as a moderator, I can edit or delete any of the content in the community. So I could change a post. Um, I could just remove it. I also have the ability to tag, um, to pin answers to the top. So I might then provide the correct answer and we'll say that this is it. And then I'm gonna move that answer to the top and pin it. And then you'll also see that the moderators of the community carry this little badge with them anywhere they go. So when a student is looking through the responses to a post, they have a really great set of visual cues about, um, you know, which of these posts are probably the correct ones from the moderator and which are more my peer posts. Um, so all that to say, there's a lot of tooling in the platform to help you address or correct any information that's incorrect. But just sort of philosophically, what we also hear from our clients is even if an incorrect answer comes into the community, they appreciate that because now they can see that that student didn't understand or um, maybe had incorrect information about something and they have an opportunity to correct it, not just for that student, but for everybody. Whereas without a platform like Inscribe, that type of misinformation is out there and at least one student might have it and they might be disseminating it to other students in a place where you can't see it. And so there's actually less opportunity to get in front of it and correct it than you would if you're kind of bringing all those folks in that conversation into a single space. Wonderful, that's all the questions that we have for now. So I would just encourage attendees to feel free to send their questions either directly to the panelists or to a panelist and attendees. Awesome, thank you, Danielle. So uh, we posted a question here and now um, that once the question gets posted, it will alert the members of the community through their notifications that here's a new question. It will provide the content of the question and the students can interact directly with that notification. Today, those notifications go out through email, although we are working on also mobile notifications. So um, you'll be able to get them directly on your mobile phone. And, it, and each individual can control the types and nature of the notifications they get. So we have this notification settings page, lots of different you know, types of notifications. And for each one, you can choose whether you don't wanna know about it, you wanna hear about it immediately, or you know, send me a summary at the end of the day and I can see all the things that are happening in my community. So that's great for smaller communities. You usually have things set to email me right away, so not as much you know, um, activity. And with really big communities, you can get that daily digest and just kind of go through everything at one time or, or look back on it when you have a moment. Um, in terms of the responses, uh, so you see the same little WYSIWYG. Again, you can add images and videos and other things. There's no limit to the number of responses that come in. Um, and sometimes what we'll see is a new question gets asked, but it is kind of related to a content or a conversation that's already taking place. And so one thing you can do as part of the answer is redirect somebody back to another area um, that, that you think might help them out. So instead of here's an answer, you might say, I think this conversation will help you um, and sort of tag that existing conversation and post it. And now the student can jump over there and start participating in that space um, alternatively. You can also give you know, upvotes and accolades to the answers that come in. And I mentioned earlier, because I am a moderator, I have this little badge. So students would have that visual cue when they log in. Um, if I were a student, but I provided an excellent answer, a moderator can also endorse that post. So I can give you credit for the post that you've provided. And now, um, again, that visual cue now appears for everybody to see that um, there's something endorsed or something sanctioned in that place. So I mentioned the resources area. So where are the, whereas conversations tends to be very iterative, very student driven, uh, the resources area is usually reserved just for the moderators. And it's a place where you can add supplemental content, videos, articles, links to other websites. Uh, in our experience, when we work with an institution, there's usually a folder of these kind of resources laying around somewhere. And so we'll preload what you already have into the community and make it available. Um, but then 
uh, what will oftentimes happen is the institution will use the conversations that are taking place to maybe drive the creation of additional resources. So let's say, for example, one of the partners that we worked with, this was an example of an enrollment community. They had, I don't know, maybe half the questions in their community were related to transcripts. And so uh, they realized that there was this point in the enrollment process where the, the student's visibility into what was happening kind of went dark and they started to get nervous and panic. And so they were asking a lot of questions about status and things like that. So they realized, well, we could answer each of these individual questions, but we could also create a resource in our resources area that explains what's happening, describes that process in more detail, get that in front of students. And now we've essentially, um, answered the question before they even have it, so to speak. So really using the conversations as a way to drive content here and, and think about how to improve processes across your different, um, the different phases of the student experience. Uh, Danielle, anything you want me to jump on? Well, you've talked about supporting the student life cycle quite a bit, but there is a question in here in regards to the enrollment use case and how you're like bringing in perspective students that are not in the day-to-day -day, um, like LMS or the, the typical CRMs that are student portals that already enrolled students are in, right? Yep, that is a great question. So for our, for our pre-admit communities, there's kind of two flavors of how students get into those communities. Some institutions we work with have an enrollment portal so students, although they're not a full-fledged student yet, they have signed into this enrollment portal space at the institution. And so we can integrate into that and provide direct access to Inscribe from that location. Not every institution has that. And so in some cases, what we'll do is we'll actually make the Inscribe communities public. So you don't have to be logged in to see them. You can browse and search for things. And then if you wanna participate in the community, um, we'll be prompted to log in and create an account. And then they'll be asked to just, you know, create an account directly, maybe with um, logging in with Google or Facebook or, you know, a social login that you might have seen on other platforms. So those communities are a little more open, um, but they're also a great lead generation. So if somebody comes to us uh, or comes to your Inscribe community, they're asked to log in. Now you've captured essentially their email address, um, first name, last name. And so it's another way that you could follow up with them from the enrollment perspective. And we've learned in our enrollment communities that students who are actively participating in an enrollment community are more than twice as likely to matriculate into the school. So um, if you have that student who takes the initiative to join the community to ask a question, that's a very high value student that you can now you know, say to your enrollment team, this is somebody we want to put a lot of energy into following up with because the likelihood of them coming to us is very high. So I did share in the chat the link to the WGU project summary where we talk about the twice as likely to matriculate. Um, and then you also touch on something that a, a, one of our attendees asked about here is how do you see um, inscribed communities being different from the Facebook or LinkedIn groups that students are creating on their own? Another excellent question. Yeah, I think we hear from institutions who haven't provided these types of spaces to students that they will absolutely do it on their own. So on the one hand, great news, students really want this kind of space um, and they're excited about finding it. And probably the two most common examples we hear are Facebook um, for things like a student success community and WhatsApp for more like academic type communities. Um, but what we also hear is um, some of the limitations of having your experience on platforms like that. One is you lose a little bit of control over who's participating in that community. They tend to be more open and a little bit more porous. So you're not totally sure that all of the participants are members of your institution or you know, that you can really understand their identity and who they are and make sure that everybody's behaving in a a kind and um, reasonable way. Um, the other big thing is analytics. You know, it's very hard to get detailed information out of those platforms. I think when we talk to people who use Facebook, they have a human being who is literally hand combing every question in Facebook and trying to like capture it and organize it. 
So um, just a ton of energy has to go into that, or you just lose visibility into that analytics altogether. Whereas at Inscribe, we are gathering and tracking all of the data about what's happening in your community. So we can see who's most active. We can see the things that people are interacting with. Um, obviously we can provide you an overview of the health of your community. Uh, you can export this information and we can also provide really detailed um, uh, learning event level data for you as well. So tremendous visibility into what students are thinking and doing. Uh, and then the, the other thing I would say is those platforms tend to be more transactional. So if something's asked in like a Facebook feed two days ago uh, and you have an active community, if you come two days later, you, it's, it's as if that conversation never existed. So you are, you still get that feeling of like repeat questions and people asking the same things over and over until your efficiency level is a little bit less. One last thing I'll say, because I am going to jump over and look at an academic use case. One of the faculty members we work with had students who were creating micro groups on WhatsApp for study groups. And the, the thing that she got concerned about is, I think she had a class of let's say 200 students, but only about 150 of them were in these WhatsApp groups. And the other 50 were just left out either because they didn't know enough people to join a group or they didn't even realize it was happening. So it creates this imbalance of access among the students. Um, and then she had no visibility into what was happening in those groups. So she couldn't tell if like misinformation was getting out or how students were using it. So when she implemented Inscribe, she knew that first of all, she could see the conversations, but it was a hundred percent opportunity to participate. Nobody was gonna get left behind. And I think that's true of Facebook too. You know, you have people that don't wanna use Facebook, aren't comfortable there. Having it in-house means that it, you're creating an equitable solution that everyone has equal opportunity to participate in. That was a Wonderful. long one. Great do. question, Jessica. Thought about that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica, please feel free to, um, you know, respond in the chat if you have any additional questions on that. And then we have one more. How long does it take to set up a community within Inscribe or how long does implementation take? So implementation on average takes about one to three weeks. Um, and that kind of depends on more about meeting scheduling and connecting with the right person to get the technical integration done than anything else. I think I mentioned at the very beginning, we have templates for all these communities. So we can give you out of the box, uh, a setup that we know has worked for other people. Um, and then you can start with that, customize it later. You can customize it before you get going. But the, the actual delivery and technical implementation time is very, very short. So, and we also have great templates for, you know, we can provide training um, for anybody who's participating. Training's great. It's a very intuitive platform. So we find that training doesn't, you know, take a lot of time, but it's usually good for an introduction. And then we have all kinds of templates around communicating your about your community to your students, launching it, um, all those types of um, resources that you, know, you don't need to start and build from scratch. And then if you have an established community already, how long does it take to set up some of these like subgroups that you've mentioned, channels? Well, yeah, so that you can just do right here. So once you've got a community in motion, um, if you wanna introduce a new subgroup, you just go to your channels area, click add a channel, fill out the information relative to that channel, and it will immediately appear and be available to your students. Mm -hmm. And um, then you could do like a little promotion that says, hey, we have this new subgroup if you want to join it, or this new channel if you want to join it. Um, but it's as easy as that. So most of the configuration tools, and especially once you're up and running with us, you can create your own communities. Um, you can certainly within your communities configure what's going on. So you're not having to come back to us all the time as you grow and evolve your experience. Nice. Okay. That's all the questions we have for now. Awesome. Well, so I wanted to quickly show another example because then we can also talk about the integration side of things a little bit more. So again, this was kind of an example of a student success community, but let's take a look because this is a very common use case of a more of an academic community. So now you can see look and feel very similar, but the content's going to be a little different. This community happens to be focused on college algebra. We have academic communities of every flavor and shape you could imagine. So uh, literature, psychology, criminal justice, social sciences, um, computer science. So really any course topic is relevant here. And this is also a place where the, the size of the community can vary quite a bit. 
So sometimes we'll have a learning community that is just one instructor, their class and their inscribed community. And the instructors using it as a way to centralize um, Q&A for their set of students. Other times we'll have institutions that say, hey, I've got 20 sections of college algebra that are all essentially teaching the same content. I'm gonna bring all those students together into a single inscribed community so that they can get the added benefit of scale of having all those people in there together. That example is what we're looking at here, um, but know that you can kind of do it either way. And the way that we've accomplished it here is we have a general math channel that all the students would be added to. And that's where a lot of the you know, questions about curriculum are taking place. But then each faculty member here gets their own private channel that's just for them and their students. So section A, but you could see, you know, we also have section B, C, D, you know, as many as you want. And students are just automatically added to the channels that are appropriate for them. And now this, the faculty member has a place where if they want to just talk to their students or if it's something that's specific to their course section, they can do that here. Uh, sometimes these communities are manned by the faculty. Sometimes we have TAs in these communities that are helping out. Um, our largest math community is actually run by Arizona State University. And they found that they were having a difficulty because TAs had been assigned to each individual faculty member, but there was like this really uneven distribution of workload among the TAs. So some had tons of questions from students, some weren't very busy. And meanwhile, nobody was really paying attention in the evenings and weekends. So they used Inscribe to pool all their TAs together. Their setup looks very similar to this. And now the TAs are kind of sharing the workload across all of those um, course sections and students are getting answers much more quickly. Uh, and again, you're not repeating the same answers in five different course sections, they'll have a limitation. The academic communities also tend to have their topics focused around the individual topics for the weeks or maybe the competencies that the students are learning. But um, so you can see same layout, same design, but with a different intention and purpose, you know, serving a different goal for the students. This is a great example to show one of our integration options. So I'm gonna jump over to Canvas. Um, we integrate with all the main LMSs. I think I mentioned also we can do integrations with things like websites, portals, other applications. We do have some courseware integration. So if you use Alex from McGraw-Hill, if you use Zybooks from Wiley, um, those are also some places where we can do deep integration at the course level, or I'm sorry, at the content level. But let's take a look at this example. So when you integrate Inscribe into your learning management system, it will automatically create like a top level access point. In the case of Canvas, it's on the left nav. And one of your options in these communities is rather than launching out to this new tab, you can actually use what we call our embedded homepage. So here um, we are loading Inscribe. What we see here is really the same thing that we were looking at here. We've just redesigned it to fit within the experience of the LMS. So we're loading in an iframe and students can do all the things they need to do. They can search, browse, look at other people's content, respond to it here, um, but staying in that context so they're not getting distracted or you know, getting pulled out, um, maybe start doing other things in there <laughs> that they can stay focused on their learning. You also can create deep links within your LMS. So one way to do that is, you know, within each week, within each module, creating a link to your Inscribe community. And then as you create that link, you can pre-filter it to a particular topic. So you can see that we've launched directly to week one of our Inscribe community. And now all the content here is specific to that week. So the student doesn't even have to search to find what they need. The stuff that's relevant to them is gonna be right in front of them. And then the last thing, if you wanna get really fancy, <coughs> excuse me, is you can create links to Inscribe anywhere that there's HTML in the platform. So in this case, we're gonna to launch to that math Q&A area. Um, and I'll show you how that works. We have a little visual editor button that pops up that you can open up and it will walk you through how to create the link, where do you want the link to go, and then do you want to filter it down to any you know, topics or things like that. So I'm going to cancel out of there. Um, 
So that's just one example of how we could integrate with another platform. Um, again, lots of places for this. So when we work with you, one of the things we talk about is where are the entry points that you wanna provide for your students, what make the most sense? Uh, and then we'll work with you to get those set up. And they're all very standards-based, very out of the box, so very easy to do. All right, Danielle, any other questions that have popped in? Yes, so we have somebody here that um, is in the advising department and they're okay. curious about the types of, of partners that you currently have in the advising area. Yeah, so um, we've worked with, <clears throat> so I'm gonna kind of bundle advising and coaching together in this space. Um, but we just did a webinar earlier this week with a, a organization called WGU Academy. Not sure if you were able to attend that session, but they are um, a preparatory organization that helps students earn credits and um, get the skills that they need to then go on to a full post-secondary degree. And they have a coaching program that's wrapped around that curriculum. And so they're using Inscribe as a way to help their students um, navigate the, the content there and then connect with coaches when they have questions. And um, it's supplemental to some of the individual and one-on-one -on -one stuff that they're doing. So we don't intend to replace all one-on-one -on -one conversations. We think that in-person stuff is still important and relevant, but it doesn't, not every conversation has to happen that way. So having this as the front line. And for them, they also were looking for ways to reduce the amount of support emails they were getting because they wanted their coaches to spend more time on those higher value activities. And they saw a 23% reduction in the number of direct emails that they were getting um, just within, I think, only having launched for a couple of months. So already seeing that big impact. Other schools that are using us in that capacity, um, Indiana University, multiple um, schools within that system. Um, Kentucky State University is using us in that capacity, Miami-Dade College. So you also see there's a lot of variety of the types of schools, everything from community colleges to big, huge state schools to some of like somebody like WG Academy is doing preparatory work. Um, can find a positive benefit there. Does Inscribe have the ability to facilitate one-on-one -on -one conversations? Great question. So part of our future work that we're gonna be releasing in the next six to 12 months is going to be focused specifically on that. And I don't have an example of that pulled up right now, but today we can do it by, um, you see here, live session coming soon. So often people will post in the community uh, a link to a Zoom when there's a live session taking place or a link to a scheduling system where you can jump out and schedule time with um, somebody for one-on-one. -on -one. We are gonna be creating a much deeper integration between those two systems. So we'll be able to surface, uh, hey, Danielle's live right now. She's open to meeting with anybody if you need help, you know, and then dropping in either a direct link inside of Inscribe for a chat or she could drop her Zoom link in. So the system will be much more proactive about letting students know who's available when, um, and then facilitating access to that in-person or one-on-one -on -one conversation. Wonderful, so going back to implementation real quick, we have a, an attendee that's worried about the time commitment and setting up something like Inscribe. What is required from the institution to implement Inscribe? Yeah, we have worked very hard over the last uh, year and a half to essentially templatize that process. So there's very little work on the institution side. So again, um, we start with a kickoff meeting. Obviously we've learned a lot about you through the initial interactions leading up to um, your decision to use Inscribe. So in that kickoff meeting, we'll review what we know, make sure that we are squared away on the use case and the purpose for your platform. And then once we know that, most of the work is on the Inscribe side. So we get your institution set up, we get your community set up, we get a template put in there for you to take a look at. And then all we need from you is a contact on the technology, on the technical side, if we're doing an integration to get the integration done um, and access to the participants in your community so we can do a quick training. And then if you want, we can help seed content in your community. We can preload things if you have it, but if you don't, you don't need you know, 100,000 items already in your community for it to go live. You just need to have the framework there, a welcome message so students know what the purpose is, um, and then your presence to help them know that this is the place to go. So it really is, is quite quick um, getting up and running. 
that's all the questions that we have for now. All right, terrific. Well, I just want to touch on one more area of the product that we're excited about, which is the profile space. So we saw that briefly when I jumped over to talk about some of the customization students can do. Um, but I want to come back here just to talk a little bit more about what you see here, which is the reputation system of the platform. So for each of our communities, um, I mentioned we're tracking what students are doing and how they're participating. But one of our goals is to give students credit for their positive participation in their inscribed communities. Um, partly that is just to kind of inspire people to get started, um, but also it's to help recognize individuals who are really stepping up and acting as, as active leaders in these spaces. Sometimes institutions will use that information to identify students who might be good student teachers or student leaders or, or moderators of these communities. But moreover, we think that the, the types of activities that you're doing in an inscribed community are really foundational to the skills that we talk about wanting to instill in students and getting them ready to go out into the workforce. So things like searching for information and, and being able to you know, find answers that exist, learning to ask good questions, learning to communicate effectively, um, demonstrating collaboration with others. And because Inscribe is not generally a graded system, it's not something you're prescribed to participate in, we see that student participation is really indicative of not just existing skills, but a willingness and a desire to practice those skills and get better over time. So we think about, you know, have you asked good questions, started great questions? Are you helping other people by contributing or answering? And are you consuming the content that other people are providing? And so as you move along through the platform, we give you credit for those contributions and then that becomes part of your overall profile in, in Inscribe. And our ideally will continue to build this out to become even more targeted and granular. And we would love to see it become a part of a student's portfolio when they leave school to say, here are all the great grades I got. And also this is the leadership I demonstrated in the communities I had access to. And that, you know, we really think employers will value seeing that as well. All right, I'm gonna pause. And with that, I will wait for any final questions. Um, and then I'll jump back over and do a little bit of wrap up. No questions at this time. Okay, terrific. So I so first of all, thank you everybody for coming and joining us today. It's always fun to talk about what we're doing and where we're going. And I appreciate all the wonderful questions that you had. I also wanted to let you know about an upcoming webinar that we have next week. We'll actually be led by our partner, Teresa Gonzalez from Miami Dade College. Uh, they are using, I mentioned you know, them as one example of folks that are using it from an advisory standpoint. And they are using it specifically to help provide better access to resources and information for their STEM student population. So that'll be next Wednesday, 11 a.m. Mountain Time. Uh, I think Danielle will drop a link to the registration into the chat. And then I always like to let people know we have this resource called a community self-assessment that we've put together. It is just kind of a, a way to self-reflect on how you're using community and, and to support students at your institution. So it's a really quick um, survey that you, that you take and walk through. We'll send you a really nice report afterward with some recommendations on maybe some ideas or tips that you could use to um, increase community across your organization. Um, and I think Danielle will drop a link to that in as well. And then I would just love to stay connected. So please reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also um, email me if you have any follow-up questions or if you'd like a more um, a demo that's more tailored to your particular institution and use case, please reach out and we would love to stay in touch with you.